So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder and CEO of Black Spectacles. Uh, in today's episode, we're gonna run through an exercise from one of our project development and documentation virtual workshops uh, with instructor Marissa Yi. Marissa is gonna review a few PDD practice questions uh, focused on using the IBC as a, re, uh, as a reference, uh, the International Building Code, uh, which is one of the four main struggle areas that we cover in our PDD virtual workshops. Specifically in today's ARE Live, we'll go over the feasibility of an addition to an existing building, how it impacts fire ratings, calculating egress width, and how to determine the maximum area for exterior wall openings in an, in an addition. Um, and you know the idea is that these are just a taste of the types of questions that we cover in our virtual workshops. Though in the workshop itself, uh, if you were participating in that, uh, you'd be working in small groups and navigate the code together, working through calculations and complete worksheets before reviewing the answers um, as a larger group. But today, again, you're going to get a, a nice sort of sampling of that. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Black Spectacles is the first ever NCARB approved online test prep provider for all six of the ARE uh, 5.0 divisions. Uh, we offer comprehensive test prep for the ARE with things like video lectures, practice exams, flashcards, and just like I was mentioning, uh, the virtual workshops as well. And it's all available online uh, with memberships uh, either for individual architects or firms or AI chapters and even schools. So if you'd like to learn more, you can go to blackspectacles.com and click ARE prep to find uh, more information about our materials. We're also proud to say we're the first test prep provider to offer an ARE guarantee. We're so confident that if you use our expert membership to the fullest, that you'll pass the ARE. And if you don't, we'll put our money where our mouth is and pay for your retake. So to learn uh, more about how to qualify for the guarantee, go to blackspectacles.com and under ARE prep, you'll find the details on the ARE guarantee. Also wanted to let everybody know, we've recently updated our construction and evaluation study materials to include a new streamlined video lecture format new lecture slides, new study guides, and new quizzes. Uh, the quizzes and study guides in particular are something we've heard a lot of you request, so we're really happy to, to be able to add those for you. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about these changes and how they'll help you pass the exam, uh, we just dropped a link uh, to a blog post we wrote in the chat for you. And of course, we're making the same updates and additions for the other exams for you, so keep your eyes peeled uh, for those updates uh, in the coming months as well. And lastly, as I mentioned, you know, we have group memberships for firms. Um, so if you'd like to, as I like to say, if you'd like to learn more about how you can have your um, whole firm on a membership and have your boss pay for it, go to blackspectacles.com and go to pricing and you can learn, you can get in contact with our, uh, our firm team that way. Our next ARE live broadcast is on Thursday, February 17th of 2022. We'll go through several mock exam questions on the construction and evaluation uh, exam um with uh, our and uh, soon to be very famous um black spectacles ce video lecturer uh, april drake we'll cover topics like roles and responsibilities of team members and managing changes to the construction contract and so forth uh, so it should be a really great session um today we're going to be engaging exclusively in our online are community so head over to that thread if you haven't already um, you can either click on the link I just shared in the chat box, or you can go to, uh, let's see here, I just did it, community.blackspectacles.com, and then toward the top, you'll see a big button that says ARE Live, and then just go straight to the top, and that's today's um, thread for any conversations. Everyone who posts in that thread today will be eligible to win a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. Um, so all you have to do is go over there and say hi. Uh, you don't even have to have a fancy question if you don't have one um, to be eligible uh, for that free t-shirt. Don't forget to stay tuned until the end of the podcast to see if you won. I uh, just shared the link in the chat box as well. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest, Marissa Yi. In addition, in addition to being a virtual workshop instructor with Black Spectacles, uh, Marissa is a licensed architect in Hawaii and California and works at Gensler in San Francisco. So welcome, uh, Marissa. And with that, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Um, let's get right to it. So for today's um, ARE Live, we will be discussing utilizing IBC as a reference. Uh, so a little bit more about this. 
getting to know the IBC while understanding the implications of different occupancies and construction types on building limitations. In this exercise, we'll analyze one scenario to answer five questions that simulate a code analysis. And then I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ARE 5.0 handbook. So in that handbook, we are uh, covering the objective 4.1, determine adherence to building regulatory requirements at the detail level. It is critical to be able to apply the IBC to the design and documentation of a project, specifically building use and occupancy, means of egress, heights and areas, fire and smoke protection, MEP systems and structural systems, as well as material and assembly requirements. So today's ARE Live is gonna be based on a project scenario. So very similar to a case study that you might come across during the PDD exam. And after today, I hope you are able to walk away feeling you know, a bit more comfortable scrolling through the IBC and looking for those little tidbits of information you need. And I'll also give you a couple of tables to look at um, that uh, frequent the exams. So hopefully you'll be able to take those tables and really study and learn how to read them so that you can feel comfortable when you do take the exam. So here's our scenario for today. And I'll read this out to you. An architect is designing a new student dormitory for a small liberal arts college in the Midwest. The upper four stories of the building contain residential units. The ground floor consists of the lobby, mail and package room, lounge, dormitory, manager's office, restrooms, and a small gym. The residential floors are each 7,000 square feet and the ground floor is 10,000 square feet. The sprinkler building is 60 feet tall with equal floor heights. It is classified as a non-separated R2 occupancy, type 2B building. Refer to the 2018 IBC to answer the following questions. So something that I um, always enjoyed doing during the exam was to make good use of the highlighter tool. So a couple things that are um, jumping out at me in this scenario. First of all, we know it's a dormitory. Then it starts talking about the stories. So we have four stories for residential. And then we have a ground floor with a myriad of different programs. Then it mentions that the residential floors are 7,000 square feet. And then the ground floor is 10,000 square feet. A little hidden in here, but it is a sprinkler building, 60 feet tall with equal floor heights. So we know each floor would be uh, 12 feet tall. And then some really important information down here, R2 occupancy, type 2B building. All right, so let's jump into the questions. So question number one, during a design meeting, the owner expresses interest in adding an additional residential floor to the building, which would be identical to the existing residential floors. The architect performs a code analysis to assess the feasibility of this design change. Which of the following statements is true? A, this would exceed the allowable area limit. B, this would exceed the allowable height. C, this would exceed the allowable number of stories or D this would exceed the allowable fire area. So again, make good use of your highlighter tool and let's um, break down this question. So here we're adding, potentially adding an additional residential floor to the building, which would be identical, this is a keyword, to the existing residential floors. And then we're gonna perform a code analysis to see if any of these parameters are exceeded by adding this additional residential floor. So to kind of sketch out what's going on here, we have our ground plane, we have our ground floor, and currently in the building, we have four residential stories. So now during this design meeting, it's saying the owner is thinking about having an additional residential floor identical to the existing residential floors. Okay, I'll just number these. Okay, so one really good, um, I guess, exam tip would be cross out the answers that you already know from the get-go are not correct. So one answer that is jumping out to me right now is D. This would exceed the allowable fire area. So fire area, 
Sorry, just looking at my notes here. So fire area is the floor limit used to determine whether a fire protection system is required. So some information that I'm just gonna copy over from the scenario. We know it's an R2 occupancy, for residential type 2B building, 60 foot tall with five equal stories. Seven thousand square feet for residential floors, and then it's a sprinkler building. So, since fire area is the floor limit, floor area limit used to determine whether a fire protection system is acquired, um, this really doesn't apply in our scenario. So, first of all, the scenario does tell us that the building is sprinklered, and it is a residential occupancy. Now, all residential occupancies do need to be sprinklered. And um, since we already know the building is sprinklered, we don't um, need to deal with fire areas to determine whether that fire protection system is required. So we can go ahead and cross this one off from the get go. And then for these other three options, we would need to look at the IBC, look at a couple tables to see if the allowable area, the allowable height, or the allowable number of stories is exceeded. Okay, so this first table we're looking at, table 506.2, is the allowable area table. So it's gonna be a much longer table um, when you look at it on the exam, but for now we've just uh, cropped out the part that we need to look at. So under this column for occupancy classification, it would list all of the different occupancy groups for us, we're going to look at R2. Uh, we know that the building is a multi-story sprinkler building. And we also know that it is of type 2B construction. So the way you read the table is you select the information that is pertinent to your scenario. And you'll be able to find the allowable area. So the allowable area of the building would be 48,000 square feet. Now, let's compare this to um, the area when we're adding that new residential floor. So if we add that new residential floor, we're gonna have five stories of residential at 7,000 square feet. So that would be 35,000 square feet of residential. Now, we also know that the ground floor is 10,000 square feet. So if we add that all up, the new square footage will be 45,000 square feet. Now, we're gonna compare that to what we found in the table here. So since the allowable 48,000 square feet is greater than 45,000 square feet, this is okay. We are not exceeding the allowable area for the building. Okay, next we're going to look at table 504.3, allowable building height in feet above grade plane. So from the scenario, we know that each story is 12 feet and that the potential new residential floor will also be 12 feet. And so we have the five stories of residential plus the one ground floor. So our new total would be six stories. We're going to multiply that by 12 feet. So we know the new building height is going to be 72 feet. Now let's take a look at the table to see what is allowed. So again, this table is much longer in the actual IBC. You will scroll to occupancy R. We do have a sprinkler building and then same thing. We have a type 2B building. So the allowable building height is 75. And then since 75 feet allowable is greater than what we have at 72 feet, this is also okay. So by process of elimination, we know the allowable area is okay. You know, allowable height is okay. So this would exceed the allowable number of stories and we can 
walk through that table just to be extra sure. So here we have table 504.4, allowable number of stories above grade plane. This table would be much longer, but you would scroll to R2. It's a sprinkler building of type 2B construction. So the allowable number of stories would be five, but we know that with the additional residential story, we're looking at a total of six stories. So this is not okay. If we were to add the additional residential story, we would exceed the allowable number of stories, which is five. So here we have it. Answer for question one is C. This would exceed the allowable number of stories. Okay. So just some takeaways from this question. Um, these three tables that we walk through are pretty important to know for PDD, and it may also come up on PPD. So again, table 506.2 for allowable area, 504.3 for allowable building height, and then 504.4 for allowable number of stories. Those are all great tables to be comfortable with and know how to read. Um, if you spend the time now to get comfortable with reading the tables, um, you will be way less stressed when you're taking the exam. All right, so let's head into question number two. It is the beginning of the design development phase of a project and the architect is performing a more in-depth code review. During schematic design, the entire building was classified as an R occupancy. The architect is now considering reclassifying the ground floor as group B. What is the required horizontal separation rating between the ground floor and the upper residential floors? Okay, so just drawing this again, we have our ground floor, then we have our upper residential floors. Just going to draw it twice so we can look at two different scenarios. All right, so there are a couple ways of classifying occupancies. Um, so what we have currently in our building is non-separated, and then we'll compare this to separated occupancies. So what we currently have in the building is non-separated occupancy. So that means the entire building here is gonna be classified by the most restrictive occupancy, which would be R. Now for separated occupancies, which is what this question is proposing, it's saying, let's look at the different occupancies in the building and we're gonna separate them where we come across dissimilar occupancies. So here we're saying, we're gonna reclassify the ground floor as group B and then the upper floor, upper four floors would be classified as R. So what this question is asking is what is the required horizontal separation rating between the ground floor and the upper residential floors. So what we're looking at is this horizontal separation right here. This is what we're wondering about. And we're trying to figure out um, what is the rating in hours of that floor. If we decide to classify the upper floor floors as R and then the ground floor as B. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is another great table to know. This is table 508.4, required separation of occupancies. So here we're gonna compare the two occupancies we're looking at, and this table will tell us the hours in rating that is required for this horizontal assembly. So the occupancies we're looking at are B and R. So here, the left side, we'll take our R occupancy, we'll track it over to the right. Then we also have a B occupancy and we know the building is sprinkler. So we'll track that down here, line it all up. And we see that the required separation would be one hour. 
So heading back here, our correct answer is one hour. Okay, let's go over some of the other answers and why they may be incorrect. So let's start with D, not permitted. Um, this is incorrect. It is possible to have different occupancy classifications in a building so long as adequate fire protection is provided. Um, I will say that there are some occupancies that are just not compatible, and you'll see that in this table, so NP is not permitted. Um, a common misreading of this table is if you happen to think that the building was not sprinklered, you may be inclined to come down this way, and maybe you would think that the correct answer is two hours instead of one hour. So that's a common misreading, and the exam will, um, as potential answers, throw out things that um, are common misreadings of certain tables. So it's not D, it's not C, and then there is a rating required, so it would be greater than zero hours. Okay, I think that covers question number two. Okay, let's head to question number three. The architect is reviewing the typical residential floor plan and is about to label the walls with their required fire readings. Wall A separates residential units. Wall B separates residential units and the corridor. Wall C separates the corridor and the egress stair. Which of the following matches the walls with the wall types that provide the minimum allowable fire resistance rating? All right, and as you can see, there's a lot going on in this question. This is probably our most difficult question that we'll look at today. Um, I think for this question, it'd be helpful to draw out exactly what these walls are describing. So we have wall A, separating residential units, wall B, between residential units and the corridor, and then wall C, separating the corridor and the egress stair. So let me just do a quick sketch for us. So we have our hallway here. That is an exit stair. Then we have some units. Okay, so we have wall A separating residential units. So we'll pick this one. We have wall B separating the residential units and the corridor. And then we have wall C, which separates the corridor and the egress stair. Okay, now which of the following matches the walls, this being A, B, and C, with the wall types? Wall types are down here that provide the minimum allowable fire resistance rating. So what we need to do is say um, between one, two, and three, which, uh, which one should A receive, which one should B receive, and which one should wall C receive that would provide the minimum allowable fire resistance rating. Okay, so our first step here would, to be, would be to determine what the fire rating is for each of the walls. So we have A, B, and C just setting up a little table for us. And for this, we're going to need to scroll to the IBC and do a little digging. Okay, so first off, we have wall A, which separates dueling units. So here, if we scroll to 708.3 for fire partitions, we can read that dwelling units in buildings of types 2B which is us, shall have a fire resistance rating of not less than half an hour. Great. So we know that wall A will be a half hour. 
Okay, next, we know that wall B separates a dwelling unit and a corridor. So here we read, corridor walls are permitted to have a half hour fire resistance rating. That's great for us. Just found another piece of information that we needed. So that is wall B. And then finally, scrolling a little bit more down to 713.4, we read about shaft enclosures. So shaft enclosures could be anything from elevators to interior exit stairs. Or it could be something like a mechanical shaft. So shaft enclosures shall have a fire resistance rating of not less than two hours where connecting four stories or more, and not less than one hour where connecting less than four stories. Now, our building is five stories, so we need to go with the first one. Two hours where connecting four stories or more. So that's excellent for us. We know that wall C will require a two hour rating. Let's go back up here, fill out our table. So wall A, it's gonna require a half hour. Wall B will also require a half hour. And then wall C will require a two hour rating. Okay, that was a lot, but we've uh, covered the first part of the question. So let's head into the second part of the question, which is matching up these hours here with the wall types here. Okay, so there's a couple ways to um, kind of deduce these wall types and figure out which rating belongs to them. Um, the surefire way to do it would be to actually look up the materials in the IBC and say, okay, one type X gypsum board is a 40 minute rating. And this, this is another type X gypsum board on the other side, so that would be a 40 minute rating. Um, because you don't have very much time in the exam, I would not recommend that. Um, what I personally would do is to try to deduce, um, deduce relative levels of protection. So as we know, type X gypsum board is, uh, if you don't know, it's a sort of gypsum board that has more fire resistance than what would be a normal gypsum board. So here in type one, we're looking at just a normal gypsum board. In wall type two, we're looking at, okay, it's type X. And then in type wall type three, we actually have two layers of type X. So what we're seeing here is that wall type one is the least protected, wall type two kind of has a middle level of protection, and then wall type three actually has the most protection. So with this, I would deduce that, you know, this is probably a two hour wall. It's the one hour wall type. And then wall type one would probably be a half hour rating. And for those of you who um, are familiar with partition types and, um, you know, have been working on those sheets um, during work or perhaps an internship, uh, maybe you're familiar with these and that's excellent. You can bring in some of that working knowledge to the exam. Okay, so now we need to match these wall types here with our table down here. So for a half hour, we would need wall type one. Wall B is the same thing, also need type one. And then wall C would get type three. So our correct answer is A. And then just to peruse the other possible answers, wall, uh, sorry, answer C and answer D are looking like no-goes right away. And if you look at wall C in particular, it's saying, what if wall C had wall type two? That would only be a one hour rating and we know that we need a two hour rating for a wall C. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross those out. Now, this answer B is really tricky. So what it's saying is wall C could have a two hour rating. Wall 
while wall B and wall A will give those a one hour rating. So technically, answer B is code compliant. So maybe some of you were inclined to think, well, let's just be safer. Let's um, go ahead and select answer B and give wall A and wall B a one hour rating. But um, the tricky thing is, if we go back to our question, it's actually asking for the minimum allowable fire resistance rating. So there we go. You know that we should be looking for the minimum wall type that will suffice. So that would mean giving wall A and wall B wall type number one. So we do have A as our correct answer. If you're feeling like this question was a lot, you are correct, it was a lot. Um, this is probably the diff most difficult question that we have today. All right, heading into question four. What is the total calculated stairway width per floor in the residential portion of the building? Use the following formula. Occupant load times means of egress capacity factor equals total calculated stairway width. Now, if I came across this question in the exam, I might be thinking, what in the world do all of these terms mean? Um, you know, it's it's not uncommon to come across terms in the exam that you have never heard of before. It, it may happen, it's likely to happen. Um, so I just encourage you to not, don't stress out, just take a deep breath and remember that you can always use control find for the IBC. So if you come across something like, gee, I've never heard of means of egress capacity factor, that's something that you could potentially type in when you use control find. Okay, so we have this equation here. It's asking for the total calculated stairway width per floor. And we'll go ahead and use this formula to try and figure that out. So just copying some information from scenario. Just a reminder, we have 7,000 square feet in the residential floors. So one of the reasons that we perform this sort of calculation is that from a life safety perspective, we really need to make sure that as architects, our buildings allow safe egress for all occupants. So this would involve the occupant load, the danger of the occupancy type, here we have an R2, and the size of the building, um, number of exits, and whether the building is sprinklered. So this is a calculation heavy question. We're gonna calculate each of these individually, the occupant load, and then the means of egress capacity factor, or decide what the means of egress capacity factor is, and then we'll come out with the overall calculation for the total calculated stairway width. Okay, so first up, let's look at occupant load. I'm gonna get to the next slide so that we can look at this table. So table 1004.5 tells us the maximum floor area allowances per occupant. And so this is going to be a long table. And your job here is to deduce which occupant load factor is appropriate for uh, the program that is going on in that space. So upon scrolling it the first time, you might be inclined to think, well, you know, this is a um, this is a space that students will be living. Perhaps it's an educational function of space. Or, you know, people are living here, perhaps it's residential. Um, but the most appropriate selection would be for dormitories, as is described in the scenario. This would give us an occupant load factor of 50 gross. And let me make sure I get this correctly. This means that for the purposes of calculating egress, you can assume that there are 50 feet squared per occupant in that area. So, 
calculating occupant load. So the first thing we need to do is to figure out the square footage of the residential floors. So we're just looking at one residential floor that is 7,000 square feet. We're gonna divide that by um, the occupancy load factor that we just looked at on the other table. That is 50 feet squared per occupant. Let's do a quick calculation here. 7,000 divided by 50. Here we have 140 occupants. And this is just for the purpose of calculating egress. Okay, that's great. So we have the first part here. Occupant load is 140 occupants. Now we need to look for the means of egress capacity factor. So let's go back to the other slide. There we go. Oops, sorry. Okay. So looking at section 1005.3.1, talking about stairways. So here it's saying the capacity of the means of egress stairways shall be calculated by multiplying the occupant load, which we just found, by a means of egress capacity factor of 0 0.3 inches per occupant. Okay. And then where stairways serve more than one story, only the occupant load of each story considered individually shall be used in calculating the required capacity of the stairway serving that start. Okay, we don't really care about that last sentence right now. So if you are maybe running out of time in the exam, you might read this first paragraph and think, okay, my means of egress capacity factor is 0.3 inches. Um, but I'd encourage you all to read a little bit up and read a little bit down from where you think you got the answer from. So here, if we read a little more down, we come to the exceptions area and it's saying for other than group H and I2 occupancies, so remember we have an R2, so this would apply to us, the capacity of means of egress stairways shall be calculated by multiplying the occupant load served by such stairways by a means of egress capacity factor of 0 0.2 inches per occupant in buildings equipped with an automatic sprinkler system. So the two conditions for this exception are here, if our occupancy type matches, which it does, and then secondly, if it's equipped with an automatic sprinkler system, which it is. And so since we meet those two conditions, we can use the exception and have our means of egress capacity factor be 0.2 inches instead of this 0.3 inches. So we don't want this one, we want 0.2 inches. Okay, now let's take this back to our big equation. So here we just decided that the means of egress capacity factor is 0 0.2 inches per occupant. So with that, we will multiply it all out. And we get 28 inches. So our answer will be C, 28 inches. OK. So note that the question is just asking for the total calculated stairway width per floor and not what the actual stairway width per floor would be. So obviously you would have an egress stair that is greater than 28 inches. This question is just asking you, check the occupant load and make sure you um, have enough width. So just as a reminder, the minimum width of an egress stair would be 44 inches. And if it's an accessible egress stair, then it would be 48 inches. Um, and then that 
um, applying this to real life, that would differ based on your jurisdiction. So make sure, always make sure you're checking um, your local codes. Let's go over some of these other answers and um, see why they are incorrect. So if you had made the mistake of using this 0.3 inches per occupant, I believe that would give you answer D. So if you had done 140 occupants multiplied by 0.3 inches per occupant, that would have given you this answer D. So that's where um, you may have gotten tripped up. And then for answers A and B, if you had potentially chosen the wrong um, occupant load factor here, that would have gotten you to um, either this answer A or this answer B. So uh, I think the takeaway here for question four would be make sure you are reading the tables carefully and then reading the sections carefully. Um, if you have time, scroll up a little or scroll down a little and make sure you're not missing anything, uh, missing an exception or, you know, mistaking a residential or switch. Uh, getting confused between a dormitory and a residential function of space. So that wraps up question number four. And here we have our last question of the day, question number five. And this one is a pretty straightforward one. During a design meeting, the owner announces they have just received funding for an additional dormitory. The college hopes to locate this dormitory adjacent to the short end of the dormitory the architect is currently designing. That's important, adjacent to the short end. The owner tells the architect to assume this potential dormitory may be located as close as 15 feet to the original dormitory. What is the maximum area for exterior wall openings on the new dormitory building? Assume the openings are unprotected. And here we want to know the maximum area for exterior wall openings. OK, then our answers are 25% of the facade, 45%, 75%, or no limit. Just to kind of sketch out what's happening here. Here we have this dormitory currently in design. And then here we have the potential new dormitory. And their distance is 15 feet min. OK, so to answer this question, to find out what is the maximum area for exterior wall openings here and here, we need to look at a table. So here we have table 705.8, maximum area of exterior wall openings based on fire separation distance and degree of opening protection. So first step is to figure out, you know, what is the different distance between the two buildings? So the scenario mentions as close, they could be as close as 15 feet. So off the bat, we know that it wouldn't be 20 feet to less than 25 feet. So it's really narrowing down to this first option of 10 feet to less than 15 feet and 15 feet to less than 20 feet. So since we know it could be as close as 15 feet, but not closer than that, we'll go with this middle option, 15 feet to less than 20 feet. And then at the end of the question, it mentions, assume, let's go back to it, assume the openings are unprotected. Okay. So we know that we'll be either going this way or this way because the openings are unprotected. Now we do know that the buildings 
our sprinklers, since all residential needs to be sprinklered. So we'll go this way. Then we can find the allowable area permitted for openings, and that would be 75% of the facade. So here the answer is C, 75% of the facade. So let's look at a couple of these other answers and why they're incorrect. So 25%, 45% and no limit. So these are all just misreadings of the table. So if perhaps you had thought that um, you should go here for 20 feet to less than 25 feet, um, there are answers for no limit here. Uh, if you had thought that, you know, the building is non-sprinklered, then that would bring you to 25%. And if you were uh, stuck between the 10 feet to less than 15 feet or the 15 feet to less than 20 feet, had you tracked this way, you would have ended up with 45%. So this is a question about you know knowing where to look in the IBC, but also just a good exercise on careful reading and making sure you understand the information that is presented you, to you in the question and um, applying it correctly when you come to the table. So that brings us to the end of our five questions for today. And let me just get to that last slide. Nice. <clears throat> well, thank you, Marissa. Um, Good discussion, uh, getting some clarity in the ARE community. So um, great topic um, and, and great questions. I appreciate you, you going through it. Um, and, uh, and thank everybody for tuning in today. Uh, be sure, uh, all of you, to, to, to tune in um, at our next ARE live broadcast on Thursday, February 17th of 2022, where we'll go through several mock exam questions on the construction and evaluation exam with uh, April Drake. Uh, we'll cover topics like the roles and responsibilities of team members and managing changes to the construction contract. Um, and you're going to want to make sure you take the mock exam ahead of time so you can review your answers live with April. So just posted the link to register in the chat box, or you can go to blackspectacles.com slash A-R-E dash L-I-V-E to sign up. As I mentioned at the top of the webinar, uh, we launched our A-R-E guarantee. We're so confident that if you use our expert Membership to the fullest, you will pass the ARE, and if you don't, we'll pay for your retake. So to learn more about how to qualify for the guarantee or to check out our individual memberships to see what kinds of materials we offer, you can go to blackspectacles.com and check out the ARE prep heading. Um, also to learn more about how you can get your whole firm on a membership, uh, go to blackspectacles.com and head to our pricing section where you can get in touch with one of our uh, B2B uh, firm sales uh, folks. The lucky uh, winner of a Black Spectacles t-shirt is Clinton H. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Clinton. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in and participating on our ARE community. We'll reach out to you uh, via email to get your size and shipping information. And just a reminder, if you'd like to be eligible to win a, a free t-shirt next time, post a question you have uh, or just a comment um, it, in the community during our next ARE live session. And one thing I'd like to mention is that our community is always buzzing. It's not just for ARE Live. We invented it so that you had a place to go to ask questions. Uh, we have licensed architects who review uh, the questions and, and provide answers, and there's good discussion going on there. So uh, feel free to poke around and, and see what uh, topics may be of interest to you, as well as, you know, again, when you're going through your studies, uh, feel free to use that uh, as a resource uh, when you get stuck. Finally, be sure to stick around today uh, for a couple minutes just to take our survey uh, to share any suggestions that you may have uh, for any future episodes. I promise we read every word that you guys write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.